Good evening to you all. I ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to be focusing this evening on verse 15. And the title of the sermon, The Christian's Peace and Gratitude. The Christian's Peace and Gratitude. So it's just verse 15 this evening. Um, but I'm going to read from... Let me read from verse 5. From verse 5, and I'll read through to the end of verse 17. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, uncircumcised circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free. But Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since, as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let's just bow our heads together in prayer. Our gracious Lord, thank you for this opportunity to look to your word again, and we pray that as we study just this one verse this evening, that you would help us, Lord, to be moved to a true and proper response to the glorious gospel that has brought salvation to us. Lord, help us, we pray. Lord, we want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds through the scriptures, we pray that your spirit would work to do that in our lives, even this evening, for your name's sake. Amen. We've been looking together at this passage from Colossians chapter 3, and my real desire through this study has been to show that the gospel that we profess and that we claim to love so dearly has immense application to everyday life. The gospel that saves is not simply an intellectual exercise aimed at affirming facts. It is not merely or purely aimed at our final salvation. It's not that we as Christians are just like everyone else in the world, but we go to heaven and everyone else goes to hell. And sometimes you'll find these kinds of thoughts in those who are even professing believers. Very often evangelism is done in this way. It's merely a matter of you need to get to heaven rather than hell. It's really about being saved from one thing so that you don't end up in final damnation. Now, perhaps Christians don't quite see it like that. Maybe that's just uh, the way it comes across. But very often, Christians lose sight of the real, practical, everyday application and implications of the gospel. Very often, when this happens... It leads to a sense of legalism. In other words, people come to understand the gospel. They need to be saved by the grace of God. And they know about Jesus. And so they uh, make a profession of faith. Maybe they understand something of the truths of the gospel. But what tends to happen is they then go back into a system of legalistic, moralistic, works-based righteousness. So that they can ensure that they now, at the end of the day, get to heaven. And perhaps without even realizing it, sometimes we do that. We go back to self-reliance. I really want this series to help us see that the gospel should so transform our lives 
our hearts, our minds, our attitudes, and our thinking, that we live every single day as citizens of heaven in the here and now. Our lives should live, be lived in every single day for the kingdom of Christ with an awareness, a deep awareness that I'm a citizen of heaven and that has implications for me now. Our goal is not so much to get to heaven as it is to grow in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ in our everyday life and so bring glory to him. If that is what is driving us, if our true identity is if in Christ is driving us and motivating us in each and every day of our lives, I'm convinced that our manner of life, our attitudes in life, are going to be profoundly different to that of the world. Far too many Christians do not live profoundly distinct lives. They try to live a little better than everyone else around them. But Christ has not really transformed them much more than people of the world can transform themselves through self-effort. And that ought not to be. The gospel ought to radically transform our lives as Christians. I don't think that's the goal that Christ has for his people. He empowers us and he enables us for so much more. And so a good question to ask yourself through your life is, what difference is Christ making in my life today? What fundamental difference is he making in my life today? And it can't just be, well, I don't swear at work. Well, because there's lots of non-Christians who don't swear at work because I don't think it's very good. So what fundamental difference has the gospel made and is it making in your life from day to day? Now, as we've worked our way through the series, uh, we've seen that all of this, in other words, the transformed life, it all flows out of theological truth. See, theological truth matters. What we believe about God matters. It is essential. What we believe about God, what we believe about Christ, what we believe about man, ourselves, sin, it all matters profoundly. But it's not all that matters. It's not all that matters. In other words, theology, again, is not merely intellectual. It's not merely head knowledge. It's not knowing facts about God, knowing facts about Jesus. Those facts must be read and studied and meditated upon, assimilated within our hearts. We need to pray that the Lord, by His Spirit, would truly open our eyes, our spiritual eyes, to deeply understand these things so that our lives would be transformed. That's what we're seeking to do. Now, I can't go over all the ground that we've covered so far, but let me just remind you that in this most recent portion of Colossians chapter 3, that's basically from verse 12, uh, we're looking at being clothed in Christ. In other words, the put-ons. We've considered the put-off. Do not do these things. Put off. Then we considered be transformed in your thinking, in your minds, in what you think, and that must be all brought into alignment with Scripture. And now we're looking at the put-ons. In other words, what we are to clothe ourselves in. And today we pick up on that, and we're going to go further into two aspects or qualities that ought to mark the Christian's life. A further two things that are to be characterizing us as Christians in light of the powerful and transformative work of the gospel. And so, from verse 15, the first character quality that should mark us as Christians, we are to be ruled by peace. We are to be ruled by peace. In verse 15 we read, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. One of the key qualities of the Christian, once they have come to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and the purposes of God, is that they are marked by a deep sense of inner peace. As we consider this quality, there are four things that I want to point out from our passage regarding this peace that is to mark our lives. And the first thing that I want us to see is the source of the peace. It is the peace of Christ. It is the peace of Christ. The only way to have genuine peace and the only source of genuine peace is Jesus Christ. And when I say this, we need to understand that the peace that is given flows out of the work that Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. 
Let me try to bring some clarity to this. We need to recognize that lack of peace within people's lives, within their responses to life, a lack of peace flows ultimately out of a separation from God and a hostility towards God as it came about in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. That moment where sin entered the world, there was separation, there was hostility, enmity between God and man. And that is where a lack of peace initiated. Man went into a state of living selfishly in opposition to God. And so he was at enmity with God, which resulted in a consequent enmity with man. We need to understand that. When you live your life with a lack of peace, it flows out of that. It's a consequence of the fall. The gospel addresses that issue. Paul has already spoken to this issue of peace and linked it to reconciliation with God. Look, at, look back at Colossians chapter 1 and from, from verse 19 to verse 22. Paul writes, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him, that is Christ, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. In verse 20, he speaks about the peace. In verse 22, he speaks about this reconciliation, that you have been presented holy and blameless before God. Dear friends, that is where peace comes about. Recognizing that, understanding that. Later on, in verse 13 and 14 of chapter 2, Paul writes, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Dear friends, this gospel brings peace between God and man. And that is the starting place of all peace in our lives. Beyond that, however, the gospel leads to peace in interpersonal relationships. And that's really the context. Yeah, I'll build on that a little bit. But really, this is critical for us. Even the most strained of relationships between people, when properly rooted and grounded in gospel hope and truth, ought to result in peace. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. Paul writes to the Ephesian believers, But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He's speaking here about Jew and Gentile and the Gentile being far off and having been brought near. And then he says in verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one. And broke down the wall of the barrier of the divining wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away. And peace to those who are near. Dear friends, this is the gospel of peace. The work of the gospel based on what God did in Christ leads to a deep peace of heart. Because we have peace with God through Christ, in Christ, and, and that results in peace with man. Dear friends, the antidote for a troubled heart is peace of Christ ruling in our hearts. I would suggest to you that unless we are ruled by the peace of Christ in this world, we will not be able to be at peace with those around us. We need to understand that peace comes from God and it begins with a right, right relationship with God. If you go back to the Old Testament, we find the Old Testament 
conveys the reality that God is the one that provides peace. In Numbers chapter 6 and verse 26, we read, The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. It is the Lord that gives us peace. In Psalm 4 verse 8, the psalmist writes, In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. In other words, the peace of the psalmist was rooted in the character of God and in knowing God, in trusting in God. And because he trusted in God, he was able to lie down in peace. God gave him the peace. In Isaiah 26 verse 3, it says, The steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Now there's a two-way situation here. The peace is from God, but it's rooted and flows out of a knowledge of God and a trust thus placed in God. In other words, when a man or woman places their trust in God, in the character of God, in the promises of God, he is at peace and God grants him peace. God puts his heart at peace. When we come to the New Testament, the work of Christ that was done, we find that through the work done in Christ's death and resurrection is that place where ultimate peace is gained. It is through the cross that we see the extent of the mercies and grace of God. It is at the cross where we find the love of God and the faithfulness of God being shown forth in all its grandeur. As we look at that as Christians, as we look to the cross and what God has done in the cross on our behalf, the extent of His grace, the extent of His mercy, the extent of His love towards us, the fact that His wrath has now been poured out on Jesus and satisfied in Him, can lead us to peace. We have a peace of heart. We have every reason to trust in God. We have every reason to, to hope fully that God is perfectly sovereign and in control of our lives and that He's indeed working out all things together for the good of those who love Him. We can have peace. Next, and very briefly, we should consider the place of peace. Consider the source of peace, that is Christ. The place of peace, peace is to rule our hearts. It is to rule our hearts. In other words, the dominating state of being of the heart for the Christian should be that of peacefulness. Paul uses the same picture of peace in the heart in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, where he is speaking in the context of anxiety. In verse 6 and 7, Philippians chapter 4, he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now we know that the heart is the wellspring of life. That's Proverbs 4 verse 23. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. In other words, the heart speaks of the core of a person's being, who we are. Remember, all of our actions flow out of our hearts. The person is represented by their actions. What we believe in our hearts, our assumptions, our beliefs in this world, flows out of and causes us to act in certain ways. In other words, when we are anxious... We have certain things that are making us anxious. And I would suggest to you that we have certain false beliefs as Christians. Because we're in Christ, we ought not to be anxious. But we have certain false beliefs. Maybe God is not really in control of the situation. God does not really love me. God's not going to really allow this to work out for my good. Now, we don't state it so specifically, but that's really where the anxiety flows out of. But our actions and our responses to life as Christians ought to be marked by peaceful responses rather than anxious and worrying responses. Our responses in life ought to be flowed, ought to be marked by peaceful responses rather than angerful responses. Again, all of this is rooted in a true knowledge of the God we serve as most fully revealed in Jesus Christ and the work at the cross. Now we need to ask ourselves, practically speaking, if our hearts are ruled by peace. 
Are our hearts ruled by peace? Are our responses to life and the circumstances of life ruled by peace? Now, that doesn't mean we don't have any feelings and we don't feel the weightiness of situations. We certainly do. We are people. But how we choose to respond to those is what's important. That's what I'm getting at you. The third main point or sub point that under main point number one is the outworking of peace. What is the context in which this peace is worked out? The context in which this is worked out is in terms of our relationships with others. Primarily, that's a fundamental place where this is worked out. The peace of God is to be evidenced through our interactions and relationships with others, particularly in the church. Notice how Paul brings this out in verse 15. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. In other words, this is where the peace of Christ is to be worked out. This is where it's to be evidenced. It is to mark our relationships with one another. If we don't have the peace of Christ rule in our hearts as individuals within the congregation, then we will not have peace within the congregation. The same could be applied in the context of marriage, families, work relationships. In fact, that's what we're coming to in the coming verses in Colossians chapter 3. And all of what we are looking at over here will flow over into those relationships. But the greater our peace and rest in our Lord, then the greater our peace would be that marks the relationships that we have between ourselves. And dear friends, this is what God has called us to. In Ephesians 4 verse 3 and 4 we read uh, that Paul exhorts the believers to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He's calling for this unity. The unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. And he says there is one body. Dear friends, there is this perfect peace and unity that Christians are to strive towards in Christ because we are one body. We are the body of Christ. He is the head. Dear friends, think about this. It's incongruent to have conflict and strife in our relationships with one another when we are professing to be directed by the same head. One head doesn't give conflicting directions to the different parts of the body. He won't do that. Christ will not do that. So, Christ is the head. He is the one that we look to. He is the one from whom this peace comes. And one further point to note from this verse is the reference to peace is the practice of peace. The practice of peace. There is an exhortation in this verse. He begins in verse 15 with the words, Let the peace of Christ rule. The real exhortation is the word rule. But there is activity, there's resolve in this. The word rule that he uses here has the primary meaning of to award a prize or to act as judge or umpire in some sports event. In other words, let this peace of Christ dominate. Let Christ be the ruler, the umpire, and the decider in the difficult decisions that you face in your relationships. Christ must be the decider. One commentator writes, to be noted is the fact that the subject is the peace of Christ, not you. This is something the Colossians have not to accomplish, but to let happen. To let go any attempt to control and manipulate, and to let the peace of Christ be the determiner. Just as in the following clause, peace is a call to which they can only respond. In other words, this is a response to Christ. We must allow Christ to rule, and we must allow His peace to reign over our relationships. It's not for us to make things happen. It's not for us to force it. And it's not to us for us to get our way. It's to say, Christ, you rule. Christ's peace must rule in our relationships. Another commentator writes, without sacrificing principle, believers should relate to one another in a way that facilitates and demonstrates the peace that Christ has secured for them. In Romans 14, 19, 
Paul writes, so then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. We pursue that. Dear friends, this calls for humility. It calls for humility. And truly seeking Christ in every situation. Now, although this is something that flows out of gospel transforming work, I do want us to recognize that we have a responsibility here to cultivate this peace. We have to work towards this. We have to be deliberate about seeking to ensure that the peace of Christ rules, that we let Christ be the umpire, the decider. Our thinking and our motivations need to be so rooted in gospel truth, the glorious truths of who we are in Christ Jesus, who God is as our Father, what He has promised us, that we are motivated to respond in light of that to those around us. There needs to be no striving. There ought to be no quarreling and fighting among us because Christ is our head and He is to direct us. The question is, how do we do this? We need to know the Scriptures. We need to apply the Scriptures to our lives. We need to understand, know God, know His character, and know His promises. Friends, we need to study the Word of God and remind ourselves of God's truth, His promises, His character. Remember, I said earlier, what we believe affects how we live. Secondly, from our passage, and I'll be brief on this point, is that we are to be characterized by gratitude. We are to be ruled by peace. We are to be characterized by gratitude. That's the end of verse 15. Paul ends with a very brief exhortation, and be thankful. Be thankful. Now, it seems a little bit strange for this exhortation to be found in the midst of uh, exhortations about how we are to relate to one another, because that's really what this section is about, how we are to relate in our relationships with one another. And in the middle of that, he puts this exhortation to be thankful. But friends, we need to understand that thankfulness, gratitude, or the lack thereof, profoundly affects our relationships with others. Find a person who is ungrateful in life, you'll find a person who's difficult to get along with. Find a person who's grateful in life, who expresses gratitude as a matter of course, and you find someone that's very pleasant to be around. Gratitude affects us. Now, this emphasis on gratitude is crucial, and once again, it is rooted and grounded in the gospel. In other words, it's not so much a matter of being thankful for the physical things that we have in this life or the goods that we have or the prosperity that we have. We can be thankful for those, and we ought to be thankful for those. But that's not what this is getting at. This gratitude is grounded in what God has done for us in Christ. This is identifying and seeing the riches of God's grace toward us as Christians, and therefore the ex exceedingly great gratitude that we have for that. That's our gratitude. Again, back to Colossians chapter 1, where Paul touched on this in verses 9 through 12. He said, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Notice that knowledge of God, His will, all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 10, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. The gratitude, the thanks to God is all bound up in what He has done for us in Christ. A little bit further on, Colossians 2 verse 2 and 3. Paul writes, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may, be, may have the full riches of complete understanding 
in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Notice this is all about the gospel, all that God has done in Christ. It's all about how that gospel relates to us. And then he goes on in verses 6 and 7. Notice this. So then, this is flowing on from verses 2 and 3. He's building on that, uh, those glorious truths. He says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. You can find further exhortations in this letter in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 3 and in Colossians 4 verse 2. The reality is that a spirit of thankfulness and gratitude is to mark the life of a Christian because of the glorious gospel. And it is a wonderful gospel. It is profound what God has done for us. We cannot even fathom it. One commentator, Douglas Moo, um, writes on this aspect of thankfulness. He, he writes this, Believers who are full of gratitude to God for His gracious calling will find it easier to extend to fellow believers the grace of love and forgiveness and to put aside petty issues that might inhibit the expression of peace in the community. Now, dear friends, while this exhortation is simple in form, it goes against our natural inclination and our natural heart. Nonetheless, it is extremely important for us as Christians to be thankful. And it's based on the abundance of God's goodness. Now, let me ask you, have you come to appreciate and realize the depths of God's love for you? as shown in Christ. Have you pondered it? Does it move your heart? Does it move you? To think about how gracious God has been towards you, given the extent of your sinfulness. How much do you think God has forgiven you? You see, if we think God has forgiven me a little bit, well, then our gratitude is not going to be very much. When we realize I'm utterly undeserving of that grace. I was rebellious against God. What I deserve is just wrath. His holy anger and wrath poured out on me. When I realize that's really what I deserve, then I begin to be moved in my heart with gratitude towards God. How far do the extents of God's grace go towards you in your life? In other words, as you perceive it. As you think about that, I want to read part of a blog post from some missionaries in Cameroon who are doing Bible translation uh, in that country. And the name of the writer over here is Dave Hare. And he writes this. He writes, we often hear comments from friends and supporters that they wish their children could come and visit us in Cameroon for a time. What they mean is that their kids have been expressing attitudes of ingratitude or entitlement and they believe that some time spent in an African village will help them to see how much they have to be thankful for. We all chuckle and sigh and with the recognition that we are not going to fly a child to Cameroon just for an attitude check. However, whether these parents know it or not, there is a greater problem with the plan than just logistics. Exposure to poverty will never cure an ungrateful heart. In Cameroon, we live primarily with the poor, and we see the things you think about when you imagine an African village. I have seen a child die of starvation. I regularly see women walking to the fields with enormous goiters and returning with impossible loads on their backs. I know one child that had to have his finger amputated because of an easily curable infection. Our neighbors primarily have dirt floors, cook outside over a fire, and have constant gnawing needs that seem impossible to resolve. I, on the other hand, have never gone long without a good meal. I have always had a way to get good medical care. No one in my family has ever died of a curable disease, and I do not worry about my children's futures ever. And yet, deep within my well-cared-for 
overnourished flesh, I consistently and disappointingly discover a deep, nagging ingratitude. My mind tends to focus on what I lack rather than what I have, and there is no physical experience that can bring remedy to this deep problem. I've come to learn that exposure to poverty does not make the rich less entitled. Exposure to the sick does not make them the well more thankful for their health. Rather, I have come to see that gratitude is a discipline. I would add to that that gratitude is a discipline that should be cultivated within the context of gospel appreciation. In other words, it's not merely that we express gratitude for what we have, but rather that we express overwhelming gratitude for the abundance of spiritual riches in Christ Jesus. As Dave Hare states here in his blog post, this is not something that we just pray that God would give us and it will just come to us. It is that which comes about through spiritual discipline, through training ourselves to look at the Scriptures, to look at ourselves, to see what God has done for us and to express gratitude for the abundance of his kindness to us and to keep reminding ourselves, to keep reminding ourselves, you have been so kind to me, God. You have saved me. You have taken me out of sin. You have placed me in your kingdom. And as we ponder that and as we think about it and cultivate, we cultivate, we discipline ourselves to be thankful in our lives. As we close, I just want to encourage each and every one of us to search our own hearts and our own standing before God. We're in this uh, section of Colossians where we're being exhorted to clothe ourselves with particular qualities that flow out of our union with Jesus Christ. Very soon, Paul's going to start applying this to relationships. He's going to apply it to Wives and husbands, it's going to apply to husbands and wives, children, parents, parents, children, slaves, masters, masters, slaves. He's going to apply it. These truths need to sink into our hearts. If our relationships are going to be marked by the qualities that Christ calls us to, and if we as the body of Christ are going to truly represent Christ well in this world, then we need to know the gospel. We need to appreciate it. We need to understand it, and we have to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts so that our relationships among ourselves bring glory to God in Christ. Dear friends, I want to encourage each one of us to pray that the Lord would greatly enable us to display these qualities more fully and more frequently. In fact, we want them to be constant in our lives. That's what we long for. That's what we strive for. I want to encourage each of us to pray that the Lord would enable us to deeply appreciate our reconciliation with God through Christ so that our hearts would be at peace and that we would be thankful people and that would be evidenced in our love for one another. Let us pray for a deep sense of gratitude for God's overwhelming kindness to us in Christ. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we... Do thank you, Lord, for your abundant kindness to us. Uh, we confess that we are unworthy sinners. And yet, in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have poured out your grace and your mercy. Christ has taken the punishment that was due us upon himself. And we have been reconciled to you. Oh, Lord, please help us to plumb the depths of the beauties of these truths. That we might respond with gratitude of heart that we might be characterized and marked by a peace of heart in every circumstance, and that our relationships would be marked by peace to the glory and honor of your name. Lord, we, we know the, the power of the flesh as it wages war against our spirit. Lord, we want to serve you and honor you, and yet we find ourselves failing. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you that we do not perform in order to earn our salvation. But Lord, help us to live out in response to that wonderful salvation so that you are honored and glorified in our lives and we have a wonderful joy as your children as we relate to one another. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to stand and sing our